Hey everybody, welcome to the Soulful Eclectic. I am your host, Diana Collins, and I want to welcome you to today's episode. Uh, if this is the first time you're visiting me, I want to say thank you for taking your time out to spin with me. I appreciate you so much. And if you are returning, guys, I just want to say welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. And thank you so much for spending your time with me yet again on um, this great day. And uh, so, yeah, I hope everyone's been well and taking care of yourself and one another and also getting that self-care in and um, just being your authentic self on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, amazing. So I hope you've all been doing that. So send in love and light to everyone out there in uh, podcast world and audio world and things like that. So yeah, so thank you so much. And so this episode, I got the opportunity to talk with um, Stephanie Carradine. She is, oh man, she's a great soul. She does some great work out of Florida. She is a mental health professional and also a life coach. And um, she does some hospitality work where she kind of just provides a place where you can uh, be better and do better. So, uh, yeah, we had a great conversation and we, we kind of started out a little backwards, but we, we ended up back on track, but definitely it, worth listening to, worth being a part of, and she does have a lot of pearls to share. So I thank Stephanie for being a part of, uh, the soulful tribe. And with that, I lead us into our conversation backwards but I want to welcome you to um, my podcast and I want to thank you for reaching out and wanting to be a guest on the podcast so um, today I have with me is Miss Stephanie I'm going to pronounce your name Corridan you did it right all right <laughs> All right. So I have Miss Stephanie Corridan with me here today. And, you know, we've been having conversations like this is our second conversation. But even before we started coming on live I and I hit record, we were having a great conversation. And it just dawned on me. It's like, God, I, I got to remember I, we had a purpose here. Right. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what happens. I get off on a tangent. We have really good conversation. The flow is great. And then uh -huh. I'm off on another world. It's like, oh, man, we actually had another purpose besides actually talking and catching up. <laughs> so, um, but with that, I want to say thank you. Um, it's always great to meet great people, great leaders in the community, and especially great leaders of color and being a woman in the community. So I want to thank you for reaching out and wanting to be a part of my podcast. I, I'm, I'm honored. I just want to say that I'm humbly honored. And um, I welcome you wholeheartedly. And I know this will not be the only time we have conversation on and off okay. the, uh, you know, wet, the, the wave of electronics and things like that. Um, but <laughs> you do really great things in the community. But before we even touch on what you do to help others, tell me a little bit about you and, you know, how you became, I want to say your authentic self, because it takes a person being their authentic self to put themselves in those leadership positions. So, Sure, sure. So first, I want to say thank you so much for having me on. I reached out and you were gracious enough to, you know, call me and we spoke. So I'm extremely honored as well to be on with you. And um, about me, first of all, I live in South Florida with my husband and two daughters. Um, I have a 21 year old and a 11 year old. So that's the first step in becoming my authentic self. <laughs> and I, you know what, I'm going to jump in there and say God bless you for keeping your wits and your sanity about you. <laughs> I have raised yes. two daughters, and they're 25 <laughs> and 23 now, and I mm -hmm. say I just say to them all the time, it is the grace of God that you're still walking, and I'm not behind bars. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the first thing there. But um, also, I, from a very young age, I, um, I guess I, I can call it suffered from anxiety and stress. Um, from like 
13 years old. I've always been a warrior, and I didn't know that's what it was at the time. Obviously, um, doctors thought I had, like, gastric issues and, and stuff like that, but eventually I was diagnosed with anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, the other side of that is that um, from, I guess, from as long as I can remember, I, I mean, I've always been a servant leader. Like, I've always been the one to hold space for people and to listen and, and stuff like that. So when the time came, I was extremely interested in managing my own anxiety, but also interested in human psychology and helping others. So I decided to become a mental health counselor. I... um have been a mental health counselor for the past 10 years. Um, I practiced traditionally. I like to call it traditionally um, Mm -hmm. because I did the insurance. I did the restrictions and everything Mm -hmm. for about six years. And then I started to spin off into coaching only because as a mental health counselor, you're very restricted. You're in a box. There are certain things you can and can't say. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you can't, you know, spread your wings per se because I'm licensed in Florida and that's the only place I can practice um, counseling. Right. But as a coach, um, although there are certain things that I cannot do, I will send somebody to therapy. But as a coach, it um, dawned on me that I was able to do more for people, um, not in a clinical sense, but in a way that was more Mm -hmm. all-encompassing, not just the mind, but also helping them with their bodies and so on and so forth. I mixed that because I worked in hospitality for a very long time, all throughout school um, and everything. And even after school, I still worked in hotels and restaurants as an operations manager, as a trainer, a corporate trainer. So I mixed that with um, my mental health counseling and I got this awesome and what I like to call a unique Um, twist of knowledge where I merge, you know, um, people, Mm -hmm. business, and mental health. And that's where I am now. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. But, you know, it all goes together, really. Because Mm -hmm. when you're dealing with people um, in any arena, you're also dealing with many different personalities and also different health and mental health issues, right? So uh-huh. it does play a part in, in how you navigate certain situations and conversations and trainings with individuals. So I think that's great that you're able to bridge those two together. Exactly. Um, and I think there's like this huge gap, as you say that it's so important, but there's this huge gap between, um, you know, how human resources in a corporation or in any business works as opposed to taking in um, consideration people's mental health and where they are in the world at the moment. A lot of times it's just the bottom line and sometimes it's not done purposely. It's just that people are in business to make money so they don't think about that side of it, Mm -hmm. not realizing that the happier their employees are, the better their bottom line is going to be. Absolutely. It's that retention, Uh right? Exactly. That retention, right? And we talk a lot about that in uh, healthcare and in nursing especially, Mm -hmm. Um, I'm currently working on my doctorate and that's one of the things I'm focusing on is healthcare Mm -hmm. burnout and how do we help relieve that and still keep them at the the nursing staff and other healthcare at the bedside because we're going to lose everyone, especially during this pandemic. Oh, that's what I was about to say, man, that is so needed right now. Right. And Mm -hmm. so incorporating that uh, relaxation, mindfulness techniques, some, you know, Mm -hmm. um, Tai Chi type yoga, those kinds of things into our daily practices on and off Mm -hmm. the units, on and out of the clinics. And that's Mm going to help keep everyone centered and also at the end have better patient outcomes. Exactly. Because we're better, we can be better for our the people for we're taking other people. care. Right, right. Yep. So is is those things that we're trying to spread out there to the community. It's like, hey guys, we, you have to take care of yourself. You can't give from an empty well. There's uh-huh. when there's nothing there, you can't keep giving. You know? And I and I say that because I have done it. 
for so Mm -hmm. long. You have done it, right? Oh, yes. Thank you. Right. So it's like we're so we're not saying things like that. We've never experienced. We've done it. We've been there. We've been on the the verge of burnout and ready to quit and just have that mental breakdown. Of course. And and that's one of the things that pushed me towards um, focusing more like I do now, because especially you're a mom, I'm a mom, you know that um, at certain points in our lives, especially when we have careers and we're raising children, we give, 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 and we totally forget that, you know, we need to recharge as well because we're so worried about the children. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things there, too, that, you know, in going to work, in helping the kids, that person gets put on the back burner. Right, right. You put yourself on the back burner. It's not that people are putting you, but you put Mm -hmm. yourself on the back burner because, um, as you said, in nursing, like right now with this pandemic going on, these nurses are tired. They, you know, they're going, going, going. And obviously if they have kids or any other type of family that they're giving care to, they still have to take care of those people. Absolutely, absolutely. And so... And and that's and the other thing I wanted to say is that it stems so far past just us as nurses and and mental health providers. You have to mm-hmm. look at the whole care team because we are all working together down to environmental services who are cleaning these rooms. We are all exactly. putting ourselves out there. So I you know and I like to say that because so many so, so many of these. Um, companies and um, Mm -hmm. those who are out here to help you know relieve our anxiety they're only mentioning the the doctors the nurses the doctors Mm -hmm. the nurses Mm -hmm. and I said you know what it's great that we're finally getting that recognition as nurses right because it's always been just the doctors the doctors Mm -hmm. but there's so many other pieces to this team and And, I don't want them to get forgotten Mm-hmm. And it's, I'm happy you say that and you mention it because that's one of the other things that I always like to strive for is because um, that frontline employee um, is what we call them in hospitality. I'm not sure how you guys call them in the um, healthcare industry, but mm-hmm. we call them frontline employees and they're the ones that are, you know, front front and center cleaning the bathrooms and right. doing certain things and they're the ones that need to be empowered as well, you know? Mm -hmm. They really need to know that that job, in pandemic or not, right? pandemic or not, they really need to know that that job is, you know, as important as any other job because guess what? If the bathrooms are dirty (laughs) at a hotel, nobody's going to (laughs) come. Exactly. You know? At the hospital, a dirty bathroom, people are going to go to a different hospital next time. Exactly. there's there's that thing where I always say empower your employees make them own their job and the way to do that is to you know give them that lift that boost that yes you are doing something that is Mm -hmm. as important as the next person yes show them that they are of value to you Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. and that the the sad thing is that a lot of these facilities uh, hospital or not um view you as a number you're replaceable right yeah you're replaceable and we have to stop with that mentality treat everyone of great value that way you don't want to or think about or can or they don't want to think about being replaced or you replacing them because you've created them to be the stellar um part of your team that they don't want to go anywhere because yeah and they feel like they belong they feel like they're you know, for lack of a better word, own a piece of this. You yes, know? yes. They're a stakeholder in it. Yes. Right? And and I um, did a tour one time where I was um, a potential client. I was supposed to go and train for them. And it was crazy, the timing, because they were doing their um, shift meeting. Yeah. And the shift manager, as I was walking by, decided to, and he didn't know who I was or anything and that's when he decided to tell his employees if you don't like it here you can leave there's a long line of people applying for oh, these positions no. and this was before pandemic 
Um, and that hotel is, you know, a big hotel and people do apply a lot. And I just stopped right then and there. And I was like, no, no, that's not how you do that. I, I hate to break it right in front of everybody for you, but that's not how that works. And he was like, oh, you know, what are you saying? And I'm like, we'll talk about it later, but let's not tell people, you know, there's a whole line of people waiting for this job. And if they don't, they need to leave. That like just broke my heart because he was talking to housekeepers. And Aww. I don't know, for some reason, I feel like if the person is making $150,000, it's, different than if the person is making eight dollars an hour when you say something like that exactly <laughs> it is you know so it's like you're scared it's a scare tactic exactly exactly wow that's that's disheartening for sure but mm-hmm. I, I i have to say i've heard it you know as mm-hmm. growing up in healthcare and working at the bedside in different hospital facilities you were a number you were replaceable Mm-hmm. I remember one hospital, they, they were treating their, their nurses so bad, nurses went on strike. Now, nurses oh, wow. actually went on strike. They, instead of listening to their employees they, that they had that were striking, they got in, nurses from the Philippines and brought them over oh, my to come in and work. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And... um. This was years ago, but I just, I remember it and I was like, wow, instead of you taking the time as management to listen and, and administration to listen to mm-hmm. the, the, what they're asking and what they were asking was nothing short of just give us adequate staffing, right? Mm-hmm. Have us have safe Things staffing that should, that should be happening. You know, we shouldn't be working doubles and triples and and things like that if we have adequate staffing. And it's just Mm -hmm. mind blowing. So definitely um, Mm -mm. that's I've heard it. Like I said, I've heard it before. (laughs) Um, And and one of the things I say for that is because it's happening industry wide, it's it's harder to um, window down, I guess I can call it, because. (laughs) It's just a mentality in the entire industry. Like, so if it's a culture thing in a company, mm-hmm. it's easier to fix. But when it's um, industry wide, it's like you're going one one company at a time trying to fix this, and it, it becomes harder. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. especially when they know that you know if X leaves, I can just go to the Philippines and and get somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. So they, it, it so. does make it harder. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you talked about growing up being anxious and a worrier and things of that nature. How Mm -hmm. as did you have counseling and therapy or did it come later for you to? So, um, like I said, early in the, like when I was a teenager and and I like to say this because I I was an anxious person. Um, It's like, personality wise I was anxious it wasn't like I was I had this huge trauma or anything like that it was just little things that would any little thing would mm-hmm. get me worried oh, yeah. so like watching so, the news and you know exactly. you're worried about mom don't exactly don't go you get know, on the train or, there was a know, train derailment kind of thing it, yeah or you know um in school if I had a fight with a friend things like that would really bother me more than they would bother you know the average kid or um, things like that yeah so at first it was it it manifested well it still does if it comes but then it only manifested as nausea like I would get I would get so nauseous and feel like I want to throw up or whatever and my mom bless her heart she would take me to a doctor and they would be like oh you know we're gonna do um some exams she probably has like a tiny ulcer she stresses when she takes the test which I did so um you know they would always attribute it to something like that um not until my first year of college did I actually go to therapy um and it was in school in in the university that I went at the time Mm. and that's when I got officially diagnosed so I did do therapy for like I don't know, a year and a half, I officially got diagnosed with um, chronic anxiety disorder is what I got diagnosed with. Mm -hmm. And um, 
thank God I was able to work on myself to manage it. So I never went on medicine. Good. But if you do need medication, you know, right. I always like to say I didn't need it. I didn't take it. But if somebody needs it, you should take it. Um, so that's when my my rabbit hole started. I started digging in, finding all the information that I can about anxiety and stress and, and worry. And that's where that started for me. So yes, I did the short um, answer there is I did do therapy and um, it helped a great deal because I understood it. Mm -hmm. what was going on with me because before when I didn't understand it I couldn't do anything like it just paralyzed me Mm -hmm. but I didn't know what I didn't know right so being diagnosed with anxiety gave me the light that I was looking for I knew I wasn't crazy I knew I wasn't making things up in my mind Mm -hmm. there was something there Right. And from there, you know, I learned how to slowly manage it. It took a while, Mm -hmm. but I've gotten to the point where I used to have panic attacks daily. Daily, I would have at least one panic attack and sometimes more. Mm -hmm. And now, in a pandemic, 2020, I had one panic attack the entire year. Wow. Wow, that's great. So, it was a lot of work. It took a while, but I did get there. And I like to tell people that, you know, when people say you can't, you, they can get rid of your anxiety. Um, it's one of those things that is misleading mm-hmm. because it's not, there's no cure. You can manage it. You can get it to the point where you don't, you know, have these attacks all the time or even worry as much anymore. But getting rid of it completely is... I don't even know if that's possible. It's a false. <laughs> it's false. It's it's actually it's a false statement, right? It, it, exactly. It's false hope. Hope. And so when when you do go back into that, like if you do have a panic attack, so for instance, for me, I went like all the way to August without having a panic attack, and then I had a panic attack in August. So in my mind, if I thought my anxiety was gone, and then I had that panic attack, it would have spiraled me Definitely. into back oh my God, this is back. What did I do? I can't, you know, get rid of this. And then I would have started having them more often. Exactly. So it's one of those things where you have to have that clear mind that it's not going to completely go away, but you can manage it. You can make it better. You can live with it. But you have to accept that it's there. That's the first step. I'm so glad you said that. And there's actually a couple of things in there that I'm glad you said. One, that you researched and you learned about oh, yes. what it was you were dealing with, okay? Because that's, that's right. one of the things that I try to teach patients, students, everybody. Learn that's about right. your conditions because if you're waiting for someone to tell you everything about what's going on with you, um, you're going to die waiting, okay? Yes. <laughs> because yes. you're going to get bits and pieces and you yourself have to learn to manage these conditions, on your own mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because medication can go but so far it's a mm-hmm. it's a nice way to help you ease your way into things and get a greater understanding but sometimes you're going to need um, a clear understanding of what it is you're going through so you can under you learn to recognize the symptomology how it's presenting exactly. in you because in your body, in yes, you, in, that's important, right? In your body, because what you see for, you know, so, so you and I, so what, how Stephanie presents is going to be different than how I present. And we exactly. can have the same disorder, but depending on our life situations and what the trigger was, what set us uh-huh. off, that's going to make the huge difference in how it's going to present itself. So um, I'm glad you said that you took that time to learn about the condition. I'm also glad oh, to say yeah. that you're still dealing with it, right? Yes. It's a yes. journey. You're going to still have things that may trigger you. There may be longer uh-huh. longer times before it happens. There may be shorter. It's all going to be t- depending on the situation. And so um, sharing that, I, I'm, I'm thankful that you said that because that, that's misleading, that, oh, take this pill, you'll be fine, and it'll manage it, and you'll never have a panic attack again. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not, that's false hope, and that's, it's misleading. Yeah. 
it's misleading. And and I like to say that every time I get a platform, only because, well, not only, but mostly because I see not only not only pills and doctors prescribing stuff, but also in the coaching arena. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen it much, Diana, but people will literally tell you, oh, you know, if you coach with me, I can make your anxiety go away. And these are people that yes. have... I mean, no shade, but absolutely no training or anything, but they're saying that they can make your anxiety go away. And and that, to me, can be really harmful to a person's mental health. And um, I always say, because, I guess, because I know both sides, because I'm, you know, a counselor and a coach, I can tell the difference, but it could be really harmful when you tell somebody who actually has a disorder that you're going to make it go away and then it doesn't go away. Right. <laughs> right. Especially if the person pays, you know, you know, five, four or five figures to make this thing go away. Right. Right. So I like to say that, you know, and, don't, you know, I like to tell people, don't beat yourself up. Don't think mm-hmm. it's you. You're not the problem. Um, this is just how it is. Mm-hmm. And, and the faster we can, and that's, you know, when I coach with somebody or even when I was doing therapy that's the first step for me is to have the person accept yes what is going on yes you know acceptance is extremely important and and so let's not go around telling people we can get rid of their disorder um any mental health issue they have for that matter right right <laughs> And that's, that's part know. of that mindfulness piece, too, because you like uh-huh. in, in mindfulness, you, you recognize that is there the thought or the, the situation is like, OK, this is what it is. Uh-huh. I, I see it. Can I change anything about it? Right? Exactly. And you look at it, examine it. No, I can't change it. OK, so what can I change? How I uh-huh. feel about it, my attitude exactly. about it, my approach to there you it. Go. That's what yep. I can change. So you have mm-hmm. that choice and that ability. So that is always it. And it, yeah, I did. I have heard those people say, "I can cure you," and it, it makes me cringe. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you can't say that. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> you can't say you that. You can actually get arrested for that. that. <laughs> oh my god! I can't, you can't. It's, it just m- reminds me of like that old. You those old movies you see with the uh, people with the bets at the trucks, the chuck wagons selling you, mm-hmm. you know, all these things. And it's like, no, you can't say that. It's going to take it away. <laughs> no, it's not going to make it all better. Um, this is a forever oh, yeah. life thing that you have to learn to manage. Um, you have to learn to manage. And I, I use that wording in everything I talk about in, in all my material. I always say it's stress management anxiety management because guess what mm-hmm. you're gonna have stress in your life i mean it's it's bound to happen we're in a pandemic <laughs> we're all stressed <laughs> and and i like to think about it stress and fear in that same little bucket and it's like do you really not want to have those things in your life because sometimes your brain actually is afraid of something and it has valid reason to yes. be afraid. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So do you really want to take that out completely? I don't think so. Being afraid in situations have saved me many times. <laughs> right? It has saved us many times just by being afraid. Um, yeah. So you don't want to take that away. Definitely not. Um, so tell me about your, your business that you've created. Share with us how, you know, what it is that you do, how we can find you, how they can reach out to you, those kinds of things. Sure, sure. So my business, as I, I, I think you guys have picked up, is two sides. I do corporate trainings. Um, I go into mostly hospitality now, but I am branching out with the pandemic. Um, I go into corporations. I do leadership trainings. I do my focus on emotional leadership, which is where I help leaders become more human, Mm -hmm. basically, is the bottom line. You know, seeing things in a way that is not so cookie cutter and policies that are there to help the company, but also need to be looked at Mm -hmm. and reviewed to... um, also serve the employees 
you know, because if a policy serves the employees, then it's definitely helping the company. So I do that on that one side. And the other side of my business is executive coaching, where I help um, people teach them tools to manage their anxiety and stress and to, you know, do things in spite of fear as opposed to trying to get rid of fear. And I can be found mostly um, for my coffee chats. I have 30-minute um, complimentary coffee chats where you can ask me any questions. And if you go to Stephanie Coradin, that's Stephanie with a P-H-A-N-I-E. Um, Coradin is C-O-R-A-D, as in David, I-N as in Nancy, dot com. And you can schedule one there. I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter under Luxy Mindset. And on Instagram, it's still Luxie, but underscore mindset. So Luxie underscore mindset on Instagram. And you can find me on Facebook under Stephanie Coradin. On Facebook, I post lots of tips on managing your anxiety and stress. Um, on a daily basis, I post something um, to help with that. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I, I mean, it's amazing, and I appreciate what you're bringing out into the corporate world because it is so needed um especially in hospitality uh we you know we had this long conversation before <laughs> getting <laughs> on and, and taping um on the appreciation but um of people and even our stressors right um yes she, you know, I, I, Stephanie, God love you. I swear I didn't mean to like unload my stress for you that day, this morning. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Let me tell you something, Diana. That is me. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, people love me for that reason because I love to have people unload on me. <laughs> like, these people, oh my God. <laughs> no, no, that was great. I, I'm happy we had that talk because, um, it gave me a little bit of um, uh, of a peek into your world as well. <laughs> oh, that's a crazy world. I don't know if you want to go in there. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely not. It's crazy. But there are so many pieces to you that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that we can definitely keep going and keep going. Yes. <laughs> so... Wow, as you can see, we had such a great conversation, and I, I didn't end it there. We kind of continued on, and why, that's why you have part two to our conversation, because as I said, there are many layers to um, Stephanie, but there's many layers to each and every one of us, and getting to know each and every layer that is a part of us is part of living, part of life, and part of growing, and part of being your authentic self. So I thank Stephanie for definitely sharing her Self and what she does and how she helps others. And I hope someone out there in uh, podcast world takes her up on that 30 minute free offer that she has. Um, and I put it in the podcast notes too, so that you guys can, you know, reach out and have a coffee chat with Stephanie. Uh, the other thing is, I love the feedback. Please keep it coming. Keep it coming. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Soulful Eclectic. Again, my page is still under construction. It's almost done. It does take a while for um, a good page, right? So please join me in conversation on Facebook. You can reach me at DC Soulful Eclectic on Facebook, and you can reach me on Instagram. The Soulful Eclectic dot com. Oh no, dot com. Sorry, the Soulful Eclectic. And then you can reach me by email, dc at the Soulful Eclectic dot com. And I do respond. So please send me um, some information, some feedback, whatever. And again, like, rate the podcast. And in case you were wondering where else you can find the podcast. I am on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, iHeartRadio Podcasts, Pandora Podcasts, and Spotify. So you can find me all over. Thank you so much. And I want you all to send love and light to all those that are in your life. And I send love and light out to you. And uh, I hope something we've talked about resonates and you are able to share it with not only yourself, but with someone in your family. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Namaste.